If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to James chapter 5. James 5, we're going to look at verses 13 through 20 this morning. But before we get there, let's first consider the principle found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. In writing to the church at, church at Thessalonica, Paul gave a significant imperative in this verse to pray how? There you go, Brother Ricky. Pray without ceasing or pray continually. Now, why is it so important that we pray continually? I think it increases our faith. Increases our faith. That's one good reason. Gives us hope. Gives us hope. Number two. Why else? Can you think of anything else, other reason as to why it's so important we pray constantly and consistently? There you go. It, it is. It's a command. You know, God. There's a reason why t- God tells us to pray. So it is commanded. And I would add to that, it is the means by which we communicate with God. You know, He communicates with us through His Word. We communicate to Him through the avenue of prayer. Again, you look at you look at Ephesians chapter six, and you talk about the armor of God. There, the, take unto you the whole armor of God. And at times we stop at verse seventeen. But you go on down in verse 18, and I would suggest verse 18 connects in with the, with the armor that God has provided as well. When, he te- when Paul tells the Ephesians, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And that is the means by which we commu- keep in contact with our commander-in-chief. I would also suggest that prayer is a surrendering of our will to the will of God in cooperation with that will. Let me illustrate it this way. And you might, here's an illustration you might appreciate, Brother Ricky. If I throw a boat hook, if I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? You're pulling, your, pulling yourself to the shore. In other words, prayer is not pulling God to my will but the pulling of my will to the will of God. And I think that's a pretty good illustration, is it not? Because when we pray to God, we are, as it were, throwing out that boat hook, and God is the shore, as it were, and we are pulling ourselves to the will of God. In other words, we're pulling ourselves to safety because we are aligning our will with the will of God. And as Brother Ricky pointed out, it keeps our faith strong. And the central significance of prayer, it has been observed, is not in the things that happen as results, but the deepening intimacy and unhurried communion with God at His central throne of control. In order to discover a sense of need, in order to call on God's help to meet that need. Again, you think about what the Hebrews writer teaches there in Hebrews chapter 4. We, we approach the throne of grace in order to find grace to help us in time of need. So when we pray, we are approaching God's divine throne of grace. Is it little wonder then that the Bible stresses the importance and necessity of prayer, understanding the practical benefits and value it has for the children of God? Think about, think about this. When you look at the great men and women of Scripture, what kind of people were they besides faithful to God? There you go, Brother Ricky. They prayed. You read about Abraham, Moses. You read about Hannah, David, Daniel, Paul. You can't recognize the fundamental fact of of the need for prayer when you study the lives of all those individuals. Indeed. He spent much time in prayer. In fact, he taught the principle there in Luke 18, verse 1, that men ought always to pray and to not faint. In other words, don't give up in your prayers. Persist in prayers. And as it is, we come to the book of James now. And again, as we have observed, it is the book of practical Christianity. And it deals with, and I would suggest as well, and I found this in my study, I went back and went through the book, it deals with the practicality of prayer. I would suggest to you this morning that prayer is a theme that permeates the entirety of the book of James. It begins with prayer, and not surprisingly, it ends with prayer. But you think in between. 
Chapter 1, verse 8, it talks, James talks about prayer and wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, well, ask God. How do we ask God? We, we pray to God. But we pray in faith, ask in faith, nothing wavering. So James begins with the need for prayer. But then you go to chapter 3 and you look at verse 9. We, it, we find an animation to prayer here. Prayer, prayer in the tongue. And in this verse, James affirms that it is with the tongue that we bless God, yet it is also with the tongue that we curse men. We learn from this passage about prayer that our prayers must arise from a proper disposition toward God and toward others as well. So we do have that connection to prayer here, even in chapter 3. You go to chapter 4 and you look at the need for prayer as it relates to humility, the need for humility in prayer. And you look at verses 4 and verses 1 and following. And the point regarding prayer in this section is that it shows our dependence on God. Those who do not depend upon God yet only turn to Him in times of need or out of selfish motives, well, they receive not because they ask amiss, according to verse 3. So as Christians, we need to recognize our dependence upon God at all times. We need to be a praying people. We don't just need to treat prayer as something we just bust out in case of emergency, like, you know, like a fire extinguisher. We need to pray constantly. Then you look at verse 13, prayer and plans. Again, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the futility of planning without God. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but you don't know what's going to happen on the morrow for what is your life. But look at verse 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. In other words, the key to making plans is if the Lord wills. And obviously our prayers must be offered in accordance to God's will. When we pray to God, we pray, if it be thy will. Again, Christ himself taught this in Gethsemane, did he not? What did he pray at that time prior to when, when he recognized what was going to happen? If it be thy, let this cup pass from me. But he also recognized not my will, but thy will be done exactly. So we pray with the will of God in mind at all times. And, and so it is we come to chapter 5. And, and, isn't it, and isn't that interesting to see how prayer is found, principles regarding prayer are found throughout the entirety of the book of James. And so we come to verses 13 through 20 here in chapter 5. And James in this section is going to deal with prayer and suffering, prayer and sin, and the ingredients necessary for effectual prayer. And for our study and our discussion this morning, we're going to look at prayer under the following headings. Prayer and an admonition. Prayer and a necessary disposition. Prayer and its relationship to confession and restoration. Prayer and a declaration. And finally, prayer and an illustration, which, which emphasizes, which illustrates to us the power of prayer. So with these things in mind, let's begin by reading verses 13 and 14. If, anyone, if someone would, let's read these two verses at this time. And let's see what they teach us. All right. Now, verse fourteen is an often is an is a difficult verse, and we're not interested in really getting into to the latter portion of this verse at this time. We do want to see what is enjoined here. The important principle to glean from that verse, from all of these verses, is going to be pray. Notice three questions are given with three different conditions: when afflicted or suffering, pray. You know, when we're feeling joyous, praise. Then thirdly, when you're feeling sick, well, the, the admonition here is called for the elders among you. But also not, notice what is mentioned, and that is pray. And that's the important point that we want to consider here this morning, is that of prayer. Again, notice, notice how, how, how prayer is emphasized here. Several times in these two verses we find the need 
Pray. Let him pray. Call for the elders. Pray. And then it's going to continue on down throughout this entire section. You, you think James is emphasizing to us the importance of prayer? Indeed he is. And, and you look at this. You look at the connections here of all three pray, of all these questions, of all three questions here. And I would suggest that the need for prayer is evident in all three circumstances given in the text. First of all, when facing trials, pray. The idea of affliction here is more general than just disease or illness in that it refers to afflictions, to sufferings of any kind. And it can include sickness, but it can also include bereavement, disappointment, persecutions, etc. So it connotes all sorts of, of different trials. And certainly James had something to say about facing trials, did he not, when we talk in James chapter 1? The need for wisdom and the need for patience. And so how do we develop these things? How do we gain, gain wisdom? Well, we pray to God. How do we develop patience? Well, we pray to God. We, we meditate on God's word. And so I think we can see the importance of prayer as it relates to our facing trials. When we face adverse circumstances in this life, the first thing we need to do is lay our burdens, lay our cares on God. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 teaches us to cast your cares upon the Lord. Now, now why does God want us to cast our cares on Him? Because He cares. He cares, exactly right, Brother Ricky. And, uh, and Peter there quoted from Psalm 55, 22, where, where the psalmist wrote, to cast your burdens on the Lord. And God will sustain us. And God cares for us. And so when we are facing trials, when we are pressed with the, with the everyday burdens of life, when we are faced with adversity, we need to pray. It, it is. It, re it really is. It, it really is because, as, because again, as e even though we are Christians, we are human, and so as human beings, you know, we're going to let our emotions get in the way at times, can we not? You know, when we face difficulties, at times it's so easy to just get frustrated and not, you know, not pray. You allow your mind to get clouded by other things. So how do we go about, let's ask this, how do we go about when we come to face difficulties, when we come to face adversity, how do we develop the mindset that the first thing we need to do is stop, perhaps take a breath, and go to God in prayer? How do we get, how do we get ourselves to that point? Thank you for that study. There you go. That's one thing. What else? Daily prayer. Daily prayer. And again, we have to discipline ourselves in this regard. You can start as a child. What's that? You can start as a child. When you teach your children right. to pray, there you go. It makes it where it's just natural. Oh, I need to talk to God about mm -hmm. this. I need to take this burning here. Instead of what do I do, what do I do? If you start early, mm -hmm. then you never learn. That's an excellent point, Susan. It's like if you never learn to cuss, then you don't think to cuss. Right. And I think that's, you know, there you go. I'll fix that here in a little bit. But I think that's a good point. You know, parents need to teach their children the value of prayer. And, and let's apply it to the Lord's church. I think one of the biggest problems we have in the church today is that a lot of times in, in our sermons, in our classes, we haven't emphasized prayer enough, have we? That's been a, this has been something, a subject I don't think we can, we've dealt with quite, uh, enough as need be. It's prayer. We need to be taught how to be better prayers. In fact, when you think about Christ's disciples, what did they ask him to teach them? How to pray. How to pray. And, should, and should that not be our mindset today? Is that as parents, we need to teach our children to pray, grandparents. And even in the church as Christians, we need to learn how to be better prayers. Because praying, in a sense, is an art. In a loose sense. And we need to see, we need to better understand the value of prayer, especially when it comes to facing difficulties. Now, the second point here, 
And I think if we can learn to pray at, in this circumstance, it's going to carry over to, well, this is where we really need to learn how to pray. When feeling joyous, well, the text teaches us to praise God. But would this not also indicate the need to pray? If you're feeling joyous, should we not also pray in times of joy? Ex- exactly. And I would suggest to you that our prayers are to be filled with joy and thanksgiving to God for all he has done and continues to do for us. Paul in Philippians chapter 4, in verse number 6, stated that in everything, in, prayer, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, notice that, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And so we, we need to pray when we are joy, joyful. And when we, we need to pray with thanksgiving, recognizing the, that the Lord has been so good to me. And so I believe, I may be wrong on this, but I believe that if we learn to be better prayers, if we learn to be more consistent to pr- in praying when we are joyful, I believe that will carry over to, to praying more consistently, more fervently when we are faced with difficulties, would it, would it not? If we can get to the point where even when I'm feeling glad that I, that I just go to God in prayer and thank Him for all that He has done for me, that I can approach Him and then, or I will approach Him when I'm faced with adversity, recognizing that He cares for me. There, there you go. In all circumstances, exactly, Sister Carolyn. And hence, when facing illness, pray. In the text, James says, call for the elders. And certainly that would involve having others pray for you. And certainly as Christians, we pray for one another. We pray for our sick and shut-ins. But also as a Christian, when we are facing illness, should we also not pray ourselves too? Indeed. You know, in such prayers, one prays for those tending to them or those who are ill and for the skill necessary to meet their needs. And so not only have others pray for you and with you, but also be involved praying yourself. Now, I think the lesson we learn from these two verses, when we think about these three questions that are given to us here, The lesson learned is that no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation we face in life, we need to pray without ceasing. We need to pray constantly, consistently. Draw nigh unto God and He'll draw nigh unto us. And one way we draw nigh unto God is by the avenue of prayer. Let us pray. That should be our mindset. But then you look at verse 15. We have prayer and a necessary disposition. And from this verse, how are we to pray? Want us to be present in our prayers. Faith. Faith. Again, you look at that. In the prayer of faith. Now, why is faith so important? Well, there you go, Brother Ricky. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith... It is impossible to please God. And certainly, will our prayers reach God if they're not prayed in faith? No, it it certainly won't. And uh, because faith is linked to acceptable prayer. As we just noted in Hebrews 11, verse 6. You look at what Christ himself taught in Matthew 21, in verse number 2, regarding prayer and faith. Christ himself said, All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. In other words, Christ says that when we make requests unto God, we got to have what? we got to have faith. Now, provided we ask in harmony with God's will and we don't make outlandish and unreasonable requests. And further, we recognize that when God answers our prayers, it is he who knows best in responding. And thus we accept his answers by faith. But Christ makes it clear that God God will hear and answer them. But we got to have faith in him. And then you look at James 1 verses 5 through 8 again. 
You go back to James 1 and you look at verse number 6. And James gives the admonition, let him ask how? There you go, Susan, in faith. Nothing wavering. In other words, no doubt. Now, what happens if we have a doubt about our prayers? What's that? Well, that's true too. It's not. When I think of prayer, I think back when we were pregnant with Lee. Right. And at 20 weeks, we were told we were going to lose him. And the faith involved there, the prayer involved there, because we were praying for him to stay, but we had to. You know, we prayed continually, we prayed for his strength, but we also were praying for our strength that whatever the end. I think that was one of the hardest prayers. Mm -hmm. Was whatever the answer was that we were able to handle it. Mm -hmm. And then when we met my small milestones, the prayer of Thanksgiving that we made it to a point where he might have a chance to live. He may not be able to walk, he may not be able to talk, but he can live. And I think that's what faith is. It's when you're going down that road and you have to hand it all over. You have to say, I know it's not my will here, mm -hmm. but give me the strength to handle the answer. I think that's a great illustration. And that's all we could do with Liam for, you know, it's just pray. You know, cast. You know, that's again. We we cast, faith is casting our cares upon God, wrecking, recognizing we can't do it by ourselves. We can have made it through those those seventeen weeks with the problems you were having with Liam without prayer. At thirty-two weeks, the nurse that night said, "Do you believe in prayer?" And he said, "Yes, we had a lot of people praying." She said, "That's the only reason." Mm -hmm. and, but it's more than just asking God that laundry list or that shopping list of I need milk and eggs and bread or I need peace and patience and this it's understanding that I need you to change my life to be what I need to be mm -hmm. and accept the answers that are given mm-hmm I think that's, you know, and the times were tough there. And, it, and I think it illustrates, you know, we learned that when times are the toughest, that's when you need to be on your knees to God. I can't remember a time when, you know, we were praying constantly. And with Liam making it to 37 weeks, I am firmly convinced God answered our prayers and God, providenti God providentially answered them. You know, God worked through those doctors and nurses to ensure to to answer our prayers so that Liam did not come that soon. Again, that's you know, from that time forward, that is that really strengthened our prayer, our reliance upon prayer. There's been times I haven't prayed as much as I need to, granted, but. I recognize, we need to recognize that, that prayer is powerful and that we can have that faith in God and that we can recognize and believe and trust that God will answer our prayers. And I think, that, and I think that's the problem a lot of Christians have, is it not, is believing that God answers prayers. Is that, do you think that's one reason why we, at times we don't pray as we ought to? Do we truly believe that God answers our prayers? Yeah. Exactly. He answers a lot. He does either. Yes. No. Or maybe wait a while. And uh, but we gotta have faith. We have faith in God, and we need to have the same faith we have in God in our prayer life. Again, you look at verse seven here of Dan of James one. If we, if we don't have faith, we, we better not think we're going to receive anything of the Lord. 
And uh, if we're not, we're not. If we doubt God, then we, we, we've got a faith problem. And we need to do something about it. And so we, we need faith. And certainly prayer and faith are, faith is linked to acceptable prayer. And again as well, forgiveness. Look at verse 15. And again, this, this is connected to verse 14 in a sense. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Again, we recognize this is not applying to the alien sinner, but to the Christian. The question is, look on page 262 of, our, of the book. 262. Last paragraph. And I like what the book, the observation the book makes here. The question is, did James associate the sickness of the man here under consideration with sins he had committed? Perhaps the brother of the Lord remembered the time when four men had led a friend down through the roof into the presence of Jesus. And before healing him, Jesus said, Man, your sins are forgiving you. Luke 5, verse 20. Did Jesus mean that the man's disease had resulted from his sins? Many contemporaries of both Jesus and James did in fact associate disease with sin. Sometimes suffering was the result of sin, but neither Jesus nor James implied that all suffering brought on by disease was the direct result of sin. Again, stopping right there, you go back to John 9 and you look at the blind man. The account there with Jesus healed the blind man. And some attempted to accuse him of having sinned because he had been blind from birth. And, and Jesus corrected that notion. That's, this wasn't his fault nor the parents' fault. There's no, he was suffering blindness not as a result of sin. Rather, James stated that along with the man's physical state here, thought was to be given to his soul. The sick man's call for the elders of the church suggested some degree of faith. James declared that if the man continued in obedient faith, his sins would be forgiven. And certainly this then is a logical explanation for and connection to the first part of verse number 16. And look at this. And we're going to look at verse 16 and verses 19 and 20 here. And in the first part of verse 16, we're told to do what? Confess your faults one to another and also do what? Pray one for another. And we notice here that prayer is a component of God's second law of pardon for, the, for, for Christians when we, when we sin. And John writes in 1 John 1 that we are to confess our faults. And certainly from Acts chapter 8, the account of Simon and what Peter told him, repentance is necessary and certainly a prerequisite, but also connected is prayer to repentance. And again, remember, Peter told Simon, Rep repent and pray that the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And remember, Simon was an erring Christian. And remember what Simon asked? Pray for me. And so prayer plays a role in restoration. It plays a role in confession. Uh, look at verse 16 again. Uh, confess your faults one to another. And literally it's because of sin and the need for forgiveness. There must be acknowledgement of that sin. And again, this is not the same confession that is made prior to being baptized. Again, this is, this is dealing with, with Christians. And the two, the two present imperatives here call for a general habit of doing what is commanded, confessing and praying for one another. And the word healed here is connected to the need for forgiveness and is applied metaphorically to the healing of the soul. Again, this is the prescription of Christ for, the, for, for Christians. When we, when we do, when we, when we become, if we become overcome by sin again, and so you look down at verses 19 and 20, and you look at prayer and restoration. And here James points to the benefits of prayer and the salvation of erring brothers and sisters in Christ. If any one of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide or cover a multitude of sins. Again, Confession, prayer, pl play a vital role 
in bringing about their conversion back to Christ, turning back to Christ. Notice that this erring brother is referred to as a sinner, and thus the need for restoration demonstrates and refutes the doctrine that once we are saved, we are always saved. It is possible to fall away, but it isn't pro probable. We don't have to fall away. If is a word of condition. If you were. It indicates one does not have to do such. And we don't. And, and that's our goal as Christians, is not to, to stray away. And so that is the, po the importance of prayer as it relates to to being restored if we fall away. But now let's back up again. Let's go back to verse 16 and see the power of prayer. Prayer in a declaration. What does the latter portion of verse 16 have to say to us about prayer? We talk about confessing and praying one for another in order to be, have our soul healed, but why? What does James go on to say in the latter portion of verse 16? It does. In other words, is James not saying that prayer is powerful? It is powerful. And uh, what type of prayer avails? That which is effectual and fervent. And prayer enables us to resist the devil, to, temp to resist temptation and sin, does it not? It's a powerful tool at our disposal. Such prayers then, when we look at the need for prayer, they avail much meaning more than a little. Prayer avails when it is doing the work, its work, which is petitioning God, pleading to God, and blessing God. We must be persistent in our prayers. You look in the parables of Christ. You go back to the book of Luke, and Christ presents a series of parables on the need for persistence in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8, we have the parable of the friend at midnight who, go, who is in need of something. He goes to his friend, friend's house at night and he begins to knock and knock. He just continues to, to knock and to persist until finally the man who is knocking on the door, the friend, finally provides him what is needed. So you've got to persist. You have to keep on seeking. You have to keep on asking. You have to keep on knocking, in other words, is what Christ is teaching. Then you go to Luke chapter 18. And you look at the parable there of the persistent, of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. And uh, there was a widow in that city, and she cried unto the judge who feared not God nor regarded man. And she cried unto him every day, Avenge me of mine adversary. But yet he came to realize because she consistently was consistently persistent in her endeavor that I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. He uses that illustration to teach us the need to keep on keeping on in prayer. But we have to have faith. And does not persisting in prayer, does not persisting in prayer indicate faith on our part? Indeed it does. And that's why Christ teaches the need for persistency in prayer. Because it shows, number one, our faith in God. Because number two, it shows our dependence on God. We have to be persistent in our prayer. And that's, and that's the prayer that avails much. Because we see the effectiveness of prayer when it is persisted in, as demonstrated by these two parables. Those depicted receive their request. Thus, the responsibility is yours and mine to pray and to keep on praying. To persist in, but not just persist in, to be patient in prayer. And this is the point of the illustration given in verses 17 and 19. And, and look at this. Prayer and the illustration given. And who does James use as an illustration regarding prayer here? Elijah. Elijah. Now, now, we might ask, why, why Elijah? Why, do, why does James single out Elijah? 
I thought all the prophets were like us. But he does say that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Again, you look at the... As we consider this question, you think about... You think about what is stated, the, that few Old Testament characters, few Old Testament characters, and again, this is on page 263 of our book, under the first, main, under the first paragraph, under the heading of Example of Elijah. And it notes that few Old Testament characters appear in the New Testament with the frequency of Elijah. John the Baptist's preaching was in fulfillment of the prophecy about Elijah's preparing the way of Jesus. Malachi 4, 5, Matthew 17. Jesus referred to Elijah as an example, Luke 4, 25. And Jesus himself was mistaken for Elijah. In Matthew 16, 14. Moses appeared with Elijah on the mountain of transfiguration there in Matthew 17. And when Jesus hung on the cross, some thought that he called for Elijah in Matthew 27, verse 47. And um, again... Mm -hmm. And that was probably something that they could relate to in their history. Quite possibly. And, uh, and I think it's important to note, he prayed. Uh, he prayed, and, and I like the description. Subject like to like passions as we are. You and I. And again, he's an exemplification of the righteous in verse 16. And as Christians today, we have been made righteous. But yet we are still human. And again, Elijah was human, was he not? And he wasn't perfect. We're not perfect. And he had the same emotions that you and I have. But he also had the same weaknesses. But he also serves as a powerful example of prayer for you and I. Prayed earnestly, intensely, fervently. And, uh, and uh, I think that's an important point to note too, Brother Ricky. And, that, and that, isn't that how we should pray as well? Earnestly? It's a good example. For us. Very good example, <laughs> exactly. And, and um, you think about the situation here. First Kings, you, you would note in your book or mark this, First Kings chapter 17 and 18 are the background material to this. And uh, prior to the confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah had asked God to inflict the land with drought, 1 Kings 17. And so the account in 1 Kings doesn't specifically state that he prayed, but James said that his request to God was in the form of prayer. So he prayed to God for this. That was the first petition. In the second petition, verse 18, is that after three and a half years, he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. Again, Elijah teaches us the importance of prayer. Of, and, and I would suggest to you as well that... Um, that this also serves to exemplify for us the principle of Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for good to them that love Him, to them that are called according to His purpose. Is that God will hear our prayers and work, work, and work things together for our good. And God answers prayer. And this is thus written to encourage us to pray all the time to pray everywhere and to pray under every circumstance because there is power in prayer. And uh, God answers prayers, does He not? And I think that's an important point to note as well here is that God answers our prayers. So we need to, we need to keep on praying as Christians because we need to recognize that prayer is a very special blessing we have. It is also a tool to aid us in meeting the challenges of life. 
It is that which enables us to confess our faults and inadequacies to God. It is also a source of comfort and consolation in the midst of suffering and trials. So may you and I as Christians this morning learn the vital and valuable lessons. May we seek to apply them, these lessons that James offers on the subject of prayer, so that we can build a better prayer life that will better enable us to deal with life's challenges. And may God help each of us to better love and appreciate the great privilege and power of prayer. And we close again with 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Let us pray without ceasing.